<laughs> Hi there. Thank you today for joining me again for another interview in the series to, to, for dog owners to discover the secrets of dog experts that will transform your life and create the best friend they've always wanted. Today, I have Ali Bender and Emily Strong here to, with me. Um, they're two amazing ladies that have uh, de developed and founded First Train Home and co-authored a book on canine enrichments for the real world. I love the sound of that. Helping behavior. They're um, also doing a mentorship, uh, launching, creating and launching a membership mentorship program to help behavior consultants become even better behavior consultants with dogs. And together they have uh, co-founded or they're they both work with now the Pet Harmony Animal Behavior Training Center, if I call it that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I'm Thank so you. Happy Thanks for having you. us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that you both have lots to share with us, with uh, the audience today. I'm really happy that you're here. Um, I just would love to, if either one of you wants to share um, what got you, how you got to here. I mean, canine enri enrichment is a growing word itself. And um, I believe our listeners could use to learn more about even what that means. But first of all, how you got there. So is one of you willing to share? Emily, do you want to uh, start? I was going to ask if you want to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been working with animals since I was 11. I started volunteering in shelters and and... Uh, at a vet clinic and then I uh, spent 27 years um, in a lot of different welfare fields, continued volunteering and, and working with shelters and rescue groups and um, I was in vet clinics for the entire time as a relief veterinary technician. I worked in wildlife rehab and a couple stables and an aviary and then um, from that background I started realizing that a lot of the things that we were doing in the name of helping animals was actually detrimental to their behavioral health, which then had an impact on their physical health and their survivability. And so um, I started taking courses and getting mentorship to become a behavior consultant. And, um, and then in, in the process of learning, I, I didn't come through, I think a lot of people who end up in this field go through like a dog training program of some kind, but I was really coming from it, uh, from the aviary and wildlife rehab and everything angle perspective. So a lot of my mentors were from the zoo world and that's how I learned about enrichment because enrichment actually came from the zoo world. It, it kind of has migrated into the pet world, but um, so I, I kind of learned about it from its origins and then moving into the pet world, seeing how it was misunderstood and misapplied, I realized there's so much more that could be done with enrichment if the pet community knew about enrichment the way the zoo community did. So that that's kind of where Allie and I converged. So I'll let her tell her so story. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Emily and, and my story are similar in that we came to this profession in roundabout ways. <laughs> so uh, I, I got here through the animal sheltering world. I, I decided at 13, I was going to open a shelter and, and single-handedly solve animal homelessness with the, the zeal that only a 13 year old can have. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that was my goal for a decade. I, um, I did internships and I volunteered and I got a degree in animal science from Iowa State University, started a student run uh, organization pairing students with uh, local shelters for education fundraising and volunteering. And it was in college that I learned about enrichment. I took several courses on enrichment and uh, like Emily said, it, it started in the zoo world. So a lot of the information I was learning about enrichment from these courses was from the zoo world. That was really, uh, really my first foray into it was learning about it in that capacity and in a, a research capacity. And, and I did a research study on 
enrichment in a in a local shelter uh, for my honors capstone project. So I wanted to open a shelter. I graduated. I <laughs> I did not get a, a degree in a lucrative field, so I had uh, at one point four part-time jobs at the same time, and it was terrible uh, in various animal sheltering and animal welfare um, fields and was dog training as part of that, as one of the four. One of those jobs offered me a full-time position as a program manager um, with a, a local spay-neuter clinic, low-cost spay-neuter clinic, sorry. And I was sitting there at my desk job and I was like, I really just want to train dogs for a living. I was still doing that on the side. I, I went from four to two jobs <laughs> instead and uh, really just wanted to train dogs. So I, I got into dog training full-time then behavior consulting. And, um, and I was lucky in that I had the, the experiences prior so that when it came time for us to start our business and, and do all the things, it was like, oh yeah, I did learn how to do that at one point in time, um, and including enrichment. So that's, um, that's my journey. That is, here. you know what, you guys, that is so awesome. And I, I guess I never really thought about where the term enrichment comes from. Um, and it makes so much sense for zoos and animals. Yeah. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. That's wow. Awesome experiences. Right. <laughs> and here you are here. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I definitely understand what enrichment means. Um, Emily, can you, can you explain or one of you, it's, just, it's up to you if one is better at saying it, but it's uh, defining for, sure it means even to enrich life. Yeah, so enrichment means meeting all of an animal's needs so that they can be physically, behaviorally, and emotionally healthy enough to perform species typical behaviors in safe, healthy, and appropriate ways. So because that's such a long definition, we can shorten that to saying that enrichment means meeting all of an animal's needs. Yeah. <laughs> so have you, have you, um, now you've gotten me curious. Um, have you, is there like, is there like stages that you, rec right? Is there like different, like the environment? Do you break it down? Right? Yeah. Again, right? Yeah. So in our tell book, us about we, how you do that. Sorry. I, yeah. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So in our book, we, we broke it into 14 categories and uh, those categories were primarily what we found when we were researching. We did a lot of research for our book. So um, much of that was coming from Hal Markowitz's work in, in zoos. He's the, the father of enrichment after all grandfather, I, I suppose now of enrichment. <laughs> um, and so we, we took the categories that he talked about in, in his work and literature, and we added, uh, or not really added, we took out calming from, uh, from one of the other categories and made it its own, because what we see so frequently with dogs, and, and not even in shelters, you know, when we were having those conversations, Emily and I were talking a lot about that in a shelter capacity, but we see it so frequently with pet dogs too, is that people think enrichment is about adding more and more into their dog's life. And a lot of times it's about taking things out and focusing on them being able to relax and rest and learning how to be calm because it's a skill. <laughs> to be yes. calm. Um, and, and so we wanted to make it really clear that that is a, an important part of it. So we gave it its own category. So we split it into 14 categories, which I can tell you what they are. If That's so, like. you know, that just goes to show how much there is to consider though. And how it yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 14. Sure. I'm going to, I would love to hear it actually. I, now that you, now you've got me curious, I think I've seen it. Yeah. I think I've looked at it, at, at it, but I would love to yeah. even let everybody here think about what they need to consider when they're looking at their dog. <laughs> right? Because it's it's a lot less than 14 when we ask people, like, what do you think's involved? Uh, <laughs> so those categories are one, health and veterinary, two, hygiene, three, diet and nutrition, four, physical exercise, five, sensory stimulation. So what they hear, see, smell, touch, et cetera. Uh, safety. 
I think is six. And that is the act of physically being safe out of harm's way. Seven is security, which is feeling like you are out of harm's way. And those are two very different things. Uh, eight is species typical behaviors, chewing, digging, barking, all the things that we tend not to enjoy as humans. Nine is foraging. 10 social interaction, whether that's with other dogs or with humans or other species, 11 mental exercise, 12 independence, 13 environment, and 14 calming. Wow, and I do I have to read it out of the book. I, I don't have that. It's a lot. And, and <laughs> I think we would, but we don't have it memorized. I know. I know. I say it almost every day and I still don't have it memorized. <laughs> It's so it's so interesting because I thought, okay, well, you know, if I get you guys, you know, talking about enrichment, there's so much there that yeah. we definitely don't have enough time to go over all of that. Um, and it's all so important. Yeah, absolutely. It's all so important. Mm -hmm. um, what it was okay. So then if you had somebody new starting, like if you had somebody, a new client, when you have a new client, <laughs> what, where, where, where do you recommend they start? How do you get them into even just looking and realizing how much different their dog's life could be. For us, I mean, so, so Emily and I are behavior consultants. We primarily take um, aggression, anxiety, fear, uh, stereotypic behaviors, all of that, that sort of stuff. Uh, so for us, because of, of the clientele that we typically get, we're having them look at what is, what is the end goal? What do we want to get out of this journey? Because we, we can't know where to go if we don't know where we're going. We, we need a, a destination. Yeah. Sometimes that destination is realistic and sometimes it's not realistic. And we'll have that conversation with our clients about what we can and, and should do throughout the behavior modification journey. Um, but we're looking at what is our end goal so that we know what are the most pressing things that we need to focus on or pressing behaviors. Because a lot of times, you know, even in a case with, with somebody who comes to us and they're like, my dog's bitten 15 people and, and um, the county just said that, you know, dangerous dog, um, designation and all of that. But what's really bothering us is how much barking they do at us in the evening. So even though we have, you know, two behaviors, one where we would say, this is a really serious thing, we'd probably start with the barking in the evening to, to get some relief for the humans, of course, managing the serious behavior so that they don't bite any more people. Um, but a lot of times we're looking at how do we just make day-to-day -day life easier in the beginning? It's so, you know what, I love the, like, I like the way you said that goals because so many people get dogs and have this picture of how it's going to be. Yeah. And it's not like that. And, you know, it's often not like that. And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, for a million different reasons, but helping people to understand their goals and helping to recognize the dog where it's going to fit in there you know, is so important. And I, I think a lot of people don't even think about what they really want. You know what I mean? They don't, right. they just get a dog and think it's going to work and they're not even really deeply thinking about how it's going to work or what they're going to do and, and what they want to do. Yeah. Right. So Absolutely. It's, it's, it's those goals are just, I love that priority. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important to um, help clients identify their pain points because a lot of times it's hard for people to come up with a goal if their primary sense of urgency is some kind of pain point that they haven't even really articulated for themselves yet. And so part of that process of goal setting is figuring out what, what is hurting? Like what are the things that are causing you that, that sense of urgency? And then once we know what that is, um, it's easier to set goals because if we can immediately alleviate the things that are causing the pain through management or some really easy strategies, then um, it's easier for people to focus on what their long-term goal, their long-term goals are not just like the immediate goal of like, I'm on fire, like, <laughs> you know, like, let's put the fire out. So then you have the, the ability to to um, focus on 
what your long-term plan is. Um, so that's like Ali Absolutely. was saying that the critical part of the process in order to help people with goal setting is starting with some kind of management um, strategy that is going to immediately alleviate that that pain the pain points that they're yeah no you're yeah yes absolutely you have to deal with whatever's happening first (laughs) Um, and usually that's the point they're at when they come for help i Mm -hmm. would say a good percentage of something's going on that makes them want to go and get help and and from there you just get to start that goals and enriching everything Mm -hmm. that's really i love what you guys are doing thank you i I do i was trying to think of what hmm I want to pick something that, you know, <laughs> like, I love enrichment games. I love telling people, helping people learn games, right? Mm-hmm. Learn to, to, for connecting. Um, yeah. um, is there, how about if I, t- can, is there a way, can you guys touch on that? Can you think of, is there any easy ways you can suggest to help them can connect, even if it's not a game? Uh, one of, and I'll put words into Emily's mouth, one of the games that we play most frequently is some version of scent work, uh, whether that's find it or scatter feeding or, or go hunt. There are a lot of variations that have, you know, made their way throughout the dog training world. Uh, I tell my clients, I played the lazy man's version of find it, which is sitting on my couch, watching TV and chucking treats down a hallway and, and telling my dog to go find them. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but we, we use that, that exercise or those variations, um, so frequently because it, it can be used in more strategic behavior modification ways. Um, but it's also really good for just relationship building and having fun with your dog and, and getting to, um, introduce your dog to other people too. It can be really beneficial for that. So, uh, that game, I, to put words in Emily's mouth, is our favorite. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That, I mean, but almost any other game is going to be really context dependent. What are our goals? What are we trying to um, work towards? And do these games um, further us down that path? But with scent work is something that's like pretty much every dog needs this and they need to right. know how to do it. <laughs> so it's like one of the few things that we can make a blanket recommendation, like do scent work, do scent work with your dog. And that's pretty much it. end of list. Like <laughs> that's, that's <pretty> <laughs> the end of the list of things that we could just make blanket, blanket recommendation about. <laughs> yeah. Everything else is, is individual context, environment, all that, but scent work, we're, we're golden. I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm like, 100 percent sent where I, d- I didn't even realize what i was doing when i started doing it with my first first foster fail i didn't realize <laughs> right mm-hmm. that he i didn't realize what i was doing how good it would be mm-hmm. and and it's just grown and i'm a huge advocate of it so like i just you know i like how um like you mentioned with meeting people mm-hmm. so would you do the same kind of thing like just distract with the food on the ground and is that like i'm just trying to vision um, in that situation it- it, yeah, in, in a strategic way that I don't really want to get into the okay. details because legal and liability and, <laughs> and such in, in this, you know, context, um, but a variation, a very strategic variation that does not include the animal getting lured closer to people that they're uncomfortable with, um, but a variation of find it is, is sometimes what we'll use. And once they get that um, connection with you, it's easier to utilize that ability other in other situations. Yeah. Right. Like if they right. get used to, I, I had another speaker talk about it with um, even going to, instead of the dog getting out of the car, when you get somewhere great to take them for a run and they just run away and sniff, take, you know, get them used to doing it around the car a bit and stuff. And, and right. You know, exactly. and they'll, so they'll be, when they get there, they know instead. Yeah. I just, I can't say enough good about scent work and how much um, I've started doing a bit more, um, it's something that's growing right it's an mm-hmm. it's an a sport mm-hmm. that's growing um here mm-hmm. in canada and uh barn hunt is too which i haven't mm-hmm. uh, had the pleasure of yet but i'm learning about it a bit and mm-hmm. but scent work is just something they just they're just so built for it every dog is different i agree i know that and the short nosed dogs yeah. you know it's different but um it just does so much for their brain and their endorphins mm-hmm. and then when they get you in it with the smell and coming back to you for more 
right? I always say yeah. it's a bit of a recall in it too, right? If they're coming back to you right away, it's like bonus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can use it in a recall capacity. You can use it to move them off the couch or out of the kitchen or, you know, it's, it just works in so many ways, as long as you're strategic with using it, you know, that's right. the, the hardest part to, um, to kind of transcend from like a trainer to a, a pet parent realm of being strategic with how you're using it. Cause a lot of times when people look at what, what we're doing, they're like, well, you're just throwing food. And we're like, well, there's actually a lot of variables that are going into this throwing food that you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. There's way more involved in it. Well, and that's, you know, to me, I, body language is just mm-hmm. the body language mindset and connection. Those are, um, to me, the big priorities. Um, yeah. And enrichments you'd, it's so interesting because you, by saying 14 things, you sure expanded my vision of what enrichment meant. <laughs> We've done that for many yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like that wasn't all in there, but I never thought of it that separately. Mm-hmm. And it's so important, you know, every dog and, and they want to connect, right? They're waiting. They're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I always say so. Any other um, tips that you could think about for connecting, even the benefits the dogs, you know, dogs pay a price when they don't and they get left behind. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest kind of blanket recommendations that I give to everybody and I, I say it to my students so often that they joke that they should just get it tattooed on their foreheads. <laughs> is uh, see with your eyes instead of your ideas. Um, We have been kind of conditioned from birth to believe things about dogs and animals. and And it so heavily filters how we see what's happening right in front of us that a lot of times people just can't even see what's happening right in front of them. And so, you know, we have all this kind of like what Susan Friedman calls cultural fog, like this, um, all of these like myths that we've been told about dogs, you know, about dominance and what they shouldn't, shouldn't do. And that they're always trying to grapple for leadership and all these different things. And then we interpret everything we see through that lens and it's not even an accurate lens. And um, so, I mean, the best way to improve your relationship with your dog is to get really good at just observing their actions without telling yourself a story about the actions that you're seeing. And that is very hard for people to do. It takes a lot of practice because we're so used to like seeing and then immediately interpreting Mm -hmm. that learning how to separate what we see from what we interpret is a skill and it takes time and practice. But it's such an important skill because if you if you learn how to just watch the behavior without all of the junk that we've been told about why dogs do what they do that isn't even accurate, um, you see a very different picture of your dog or your cat or your horse or your pig or your goat, whatever, right? Um, and then it makes it easier to kind of bridge the gap and build a relationship because you're not inventing all these fantasies about, you know, their like devious manipulative plan to take over the house and like their Machiavellian desire to torment you and punish you for perceived wrongs. Like all these things that get in the way of relationships with our pets are almost completely happening inside of our brain instead of outside in the real world. So learning how to separate those two things is one of the best things you can do to improve your relationship with your pets. Well said. Well said. It's true. Yeah. You know, people how many don't understand it all. We're even conversations we've had about dogs um, to do with smiling mm-hmm. and being misunderstood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And and because yeah. some dogs do it so quickly. Some dogs do it really well. And and I and um I want I I'm yeah, I'm awful. I don't want to say wrong names, but I did have another speaker give an example of a dog with a that the family had come with this dog and they thought it was aggressive and here the dog was and so they were like treating it like it was aggressive too yeah. and it was just smiling yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> but imagine what that dog went through before they knew that because right. I would it went before I know I still remember the first time a dog out of the blue did it to me I'm like 
what's that dog doing? Does he want to eat me? <laughs> right? Like it looks, it looks funny the first time you see it, you don't realize and watching them, just yeah. studying them and learning and taking mm-hmm. out, oh, I like that, taking out all your stuff in the way. And um, I know I, I, I find, especially if I'm present as a dog trainer, if I'm working with fearful dogs and stuff like that, some of them are come to me very quickly and the person takes it, they can take it personally. Mm-hmm. right if they're if they're the t- person really wanting to get it right and with their dog and the dog feels that and you know whatever it is my energy comes in it's in it confuses the owner but dogs are just doing the best they can and and you just have to figure you look trust your dog and forget about like you say all that other stuff yeah right put that away and just spend be just be with the dog yeah and watch exactly exactly it's pretty amazing when they do. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be challenging people to do it. Just be, imagine what you learn. I learned lots studying my yeah. dogs. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. They're great yeah. teachers. If we just yes, they are. listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if we give them yeah. a chance and realize that they're mm-hmm. not us, they don't talk like us. Right. <laughs> they, really, they, they weren't meant to be come into our homes and be in our lives like this, but they want to. They don't, they don't think like we do. And they have just have very different behaviors than what we attribute to them. Yeah. The st- what did you say? The stereotype, right? I like that mm-hmm. statement for sure. yeah. That's what yeah. it is. It's, it's very, <laughs> it's awesome. And you guys are doing great, getting more and more courses going. You're on sc- mm-hmm. schools going. That's so exciting for you and for dog owners. <laughs> you guys yeah. do a lot. Do you do a lot on Zoom? Do you do a lot of dog... I, I guess we do a ton on zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, like everybody else with, with the pandemic, we were, we were forced to, but the thing that we were really lucky about with, um, with all of that is that we had been offering remote consultations for what, five, five years, years before, uh, before 2020. And so when, uh, when a lot of people and, and a lot of our peers and colleagues were scrambling about, oh my gosh, how, how do I trans transition into this new platform? And we were like, all right, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> right. It, Tuesday. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd only, I'd only been I, like at the beginning of 2020 before the pandemic, January 1st, I stopped seeing clients in person altogether. So I was already in a remote only practice when the pandemic hit. So, um, yeah. So it yeah. was thankfully very easy for us to transition yeah. over. But um, one of the other things that we were thankful for is that we had already planned on doing more, uh, offering more online services and, uh, and being able to serve more people through an online platform in 2020. And uh, the pandemic essentially said, you're doing that now, whether you would like to or not. <laughs> so, uh, so we were really fortunate in that we were already set up to do all of that. I mean, we have clients mm-hmm. all over the country, all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's great to get to work with, with a lot of different people. Yeah. And it's doable. And it's yeah. doable. Yeah. We can do everything. We can address everything. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's what, platform you know. is yeah, making it so easy. We have students in other countries and um, and clients in other countries, and we couldn't do that if we were just working in person. So it's really enabled us to um, connect with people all over the world instead of just in our the cities we live in. Yeah, isn't that pretty awesome? And I'm really, you know, it, I, yeah. I just yeah. it's just amazing how much you can do, and I love doing it. And I I feel that's what I feel yeah. like. The world is out there this way. I don't have to worry about you know, trying to fit everybody into my yard. We're, we're, yeah, you know, we're, they vir- <laughs> yeah. virtually is the way. And um, yeah, I'm so happy that you guys joined me today. That's a lot of great information, you know, and for dog owners, there's, there's people waiting to connect and, and you've definitely given some great ideas and even encouraging them to look more into enrichment in, in well, not only in your book, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> like to just realize that it's, that there's so much more. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I'm so glad. I'll stop recording. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. (laughs) Thank you. Awesome.